The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. On last week's show, today's guest, Ginny Jablonski, described two NDEs in her life, which led her finally to the work in animal and plant communications she does today. In her first NDE, at age three, she pleaded with Creator to take her home from a life of abuse. In the second, as an adult, herds of horses and donkeys called her back from the hand of Jesus with the cry, don't go, don't go, you have something important to do. Ginny, welcome back to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. I'm excited to be with you again today. Well, I am too, and to hear more about animal communications. Before we get to that, though, um, before your second NDE, you had horses and worked at a shelter for abused animals. And I was wondering, were any of the horses who called to you in your NDE animals you recognized? I can't say for sure. I feel that they were the animals at the shelter, but there wasn't any one that was very distinct. It seemed as though it was the herd of horses and donkeys from the sanctuary, yes. Oh, okay. And then you said you traveled after uh, that NDE to uh, Australia to study with an Aboriginal woman and to Brazil to study with a, a, a shaman. Uh, tell us a little about what you learned from those experiences. Well, um, are you familiar with the book uh, Rudolf Steiner's Kindred Spirits, where he goes into detail comparing different spiritual philosophies or religious deities or, you know, luminaries? Uh, yes. That is sort of representative of my journey. And had I known that books like that existed, I might not have spent so much time. <laughs> Reinventing the wheel. <laughs> and boy, let me tell you, I reinvented the wheel in every shape possible before it became round. Oh. Um, I will share that my experience up until I met th with the Aboriginal woman in Australia was that I didn't believe in anything or disbelieve in anything. I, I was open to learning everything because I believed everybody thinking that they must surely be experts in their field. But what I came to understand was that everybody thought that everybody else was wrong. <laughs> and so it became rather disconcerting to me. But my experience was that there were many people willing to tell me what was wrong with me and many people willing to share with me past lives that were influencing my current life. And it was very information heavy but i came to understand that the information was not evolution and in australia i learned that there was a reason why having access to that information is so important and that is that our past lives our wounds our unforgiveness even our physical injuries manifest through soul patterns a soul blueprint in this life, and it informs the patterns that we manifest in this life. Mm -hmm. And she was the first one to teach me about that and use different terminologies and give me tools that I could use to heal myself. And it was quite fascinating and completely changed the trajectory of my healing journey. All right, well, let's get into animal communication. Tell us about how you first discovered you could communicate with animals and with plants, and uh, what were they communicating to you? Well, at first it was just little snippets of information. I'd walk by a bush, and the bush might say hello, or, <clears throat> you know, if I went to a, a weekend or three-day or even week-long meditation course or learning different healing modalities, we would be encouraged to go outside and sit and meditate with nature. And sure enough, the ants would talk to me and 
I have to be honest, I I don't remember a lot of of those communications. In fact, even when I work with animals today, it really channels through me. So I don't remember even from week to week or month to month with clients what is said. But for example, plants often share with me information about the elements of the earth. So if a person is not in balance, their their water and their fire and their earth elements are not in balance, that is generally what plants will share with me. If there is a block, for example, I was in Seattle once in the in the mountains and a tree <clears throat> said to me that part of me, this is maybe about a year and a half ago, you've been cut off from the element of fire. And so I was able to do a healing on myself and look inside and find that block, that energetic block to the element of fire. It's quite fascinating. I usually don't get small talk, which I have to be honest, does separate me quite a bit from some of the more traditional animal communicators who, quite frankly, made it up themselves as they went. And what I have found over the years in working with the many different healers that I have worked with and the many different philosophies and modalities that I've experienced is that information is brought forward within the box that you live in, within your own paradigm. So if you have a tendency to believe in the cosmology of the universe as presented by Buddhism, generally speaking, that's how you're going to receive information. If you are very, um, well, you really can't even today say Christian because it has so many different connotations, thousands of, of differing frankly, in some oppositional belief systems within the realm of Christianity, you will receive your information, generally speaking, within the confines of that paradigm. Mm -hmm. So that when you are, say, with a horse that seems to be the vehicle for the communication, do you feel it's consciousness, generally speaking, through that individual to you? Is it the creator speaking through through uh, the horse or is it the, the personality, the soul of the horse itself that's communicating? That's an interesting question and it's not a simple answer because every animal in every situation is different. There will be people who would answer this question differently, but my experience is that depending on the circumstance a group of donkeys might speak to me as the sole group of donkeys. But there may be one donkey who comes forward with a very individual personality. My experience is that I could say that dependent upon the earthly experience and experiences of the incarnations, of the soul aspect that is in an individual animal, that is what I will receive. So if we have a a formerly wild Mustang that has been traumatized, has been rounded up by the BLM, has been adopted out and mishandled and brought back and gone through multiple owners, feeling the abandonment of his herd, and feeling the abandonment and disappointment of several owners, the communication with that animal will be different because they are so traumatized. Mm. But there are many different reasons why the information might be different from an animal, not the least of which is the cosmology or the paradigm of the caretaker that I am communicating with. Usually animals will not go too far beyond the paradigm of their owner. I've been very lucky that most people that come to me are very open and have a long history, oftentimes longer than my history of, of seeking, of being on a journey, of, of reading, of traveling, of 
experiencing different healing modalities and being open. Do you suppose the uh, the animal, especially a pet, for instance, a dog or a cat, has been following the uh, the owner's life, reincarnating? Does it have a relationship that goes on into uh, past lives and future lives? Yes, sometimes that is the case. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the animal feels that they have an obligation to carry the burdens of a human. And sometimes they're there for some sort of reconciliation or forgiveness or karmic resolution as opposed to obligation. And it's very interesting because some animals pick up on our human belief systems and our human paradigms. And some animals very much take on almost the personality traits uh, together with the belief systems of the animals. And it's quite interesting because from time to time, I'll have an animal speak uh, using, you know, very unique foul language and, and it'll just come flying out of my mouth because mm. I, I often channel more than I hear and repeat. And I'll look around with wide eyes and say, oh, is there someone around here that talks like this? And there'll always be someone who lowers their head and says under their breath, mm, yeah, that'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Now, okay, that that leads me to my next question, because is this communication coming to you uh, in words uh, or more um, uh, emotional uh, patterns or um, pictures even? Well, because I have all gifts, I have all eight of the clairs, you know, clairsentience, clairaudience, clairvoyance, everything. I have all those gifts, I believe, so that I can communicate in every way with beings, both human plants and animals, dependent on their gifts, because some animals communicate through picture. Some animals communicate through all you really feel is emotion. Like I can only say I have a sense, a strong sense of a certain emotion. Now, generally, animals that communicate in such a limited way have blocks, and I've been able to identify what many of those blocks are. But often, animals um, don't have a good sense of time, past, present, future. They get a little confused. Some clearly speak English to me all day long, and I cannot tell you the number of people that absolutely do not believe that animals are capable of communicating that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that is because of the limited paradigms. You know, I was so lucky to have had two NDEs and to have been on the other side and to have opened myself to the higher frequencies and higher awareness and to have had, um, two very profound spiritually transformative experiences, which have, has made it almost impossible for me to question the information that I receive. And not to mention the fact that I've spent easily tens of thousands of dollars on validating the information that I'm getting is is accurate. Mm. Do you think this gift, this communications gift, came to you as a result of Jesus holding your hand, or was it a gift from the horses, the spirits of the horses and donkeys that spoke to you? Well, my sense is that it is coming from the animals and when you asked the question I got chills when you said do you think it's coming from the horses and donkeys so I do feel very strongly that I have a partnership which has not yet been clearly spelled out for me with the animal kingdom I know that there's more to know and more to receive and more to learn and I know that my journey continues to change and shift as well as my abilities continue to change and shift. I can tell you that it is because of them that I am alive, that they are keeping me alive in some way. And I do feel strongly that it is a purpose that is, that does have everything to do with the animals. Uh Do you, um, you you believe that uh, animals have had some past lives as humans. Um, do, do you think that they choose their method of communication 
uh, as a result of that? I mean, are, would they be more likely to communicate in words if they had been a human in a past life? My sense is yes. Um, I had no reason to doubt that that would be true, but I also had no reason to make it up. Because in the very beginning of my journey, I worked with an amazing woman who had been trained by a shaman on the East Coast who was an animal communicator, and I learned quite a bit from her. But her belief system was that animal souls cannot be human souls. And for a time, I I believed her. As I said, if I went to a teacher, a mentor, a guru, I believed them. And her belief system was that only dogs could become animal souls if they were able, lucky enough, to experience the true love of a human being, which seemed a little convoluted, but I believed it until the animals started telling me that's not true. It's Mm. just not true. And I found I would have experiences when I, I went to many different famous animal communicators to try to learn or to, to, you know, in that space of doubt to try to validate myself. And I, I wasn't as successful in validating myself as I was in demonstrating through their eyes, as I was in demonstrating that I had a very unique, much higher, much more refined ability. I will share that, for example, I was at one very famous woman's house once and the exercise was to ask the cat, you know, what is your favorite toy and where do you sleep and what color is the food dish you eat out of? And the cat said to me, why would you even waste your time asking me those ridiculous questions? I have a real problem that you can solve for me. I need you to help me and you're going to leave in a little bit. So will you please attend to my issues. And uh, and so I said, yes, what is that? And he said, she has all these people come here for all these animal communication classes. And all of these people are dumping their energetic detritus on me. And, <laughs> and, you know, I really wish that this wouldn't happen. So it came around the circle to me uh, to say what, you know, is the cat's favorite toy. And I said, respectfully, your cat did not want to answer those questions. Your cat wanted to share with me something that he wanted to communicate with you. And I said, may I have permission to share what the cat communicated? And um, she did not receive the information well. I mean, this was a woman who believed that cats cannot do not know what scissors are. So they cannot possibly tell you that they like sitting on the desk by the orange scissors that they can only give you a picture of the scissor. But this is what happens to so many people like me, people who from the, no, pardon me, let me reframe that. People who, who, this is not like me at all. I, I was not able to communicate with animals since my birth. I have met so many people that have come to me that have been able to communicate with animals and plants from the time they were young. And they have been discredited so many times by, quote unquote, professional people teaching certain protocols and teaching, you know, this is how the universe works and this is how energy flows and this is how animals communicate. And and they get insulted and they get invalidated and they go away with their tails between the le- their legs and they think there's something wrong with them. But these are the people that come to me because I believe in them. Because I can see and I can hear the things that they can see and hear. Mm. I had a a client with a horse once, Lee, and the horse was not a horse soul. The horse was a zebra. And I happened to know a woman in Ramona, California, who was an expert on wild zebra behavior. And I paid out of my own pocket and I went to her and I said, I have a horse and this is his behavior. Can you please tell me? what this represents to you. And she said, oh, this horse is a zebra. And I said, I knew it. I told the owner (laughs) that I thought that the horse was a zebra. And she goes, Ginny, you cannot go around telling people that their horses are zebras. They're going to think you're crazy. And I said, you know, lucky enough, the woman was willing to have another session with me. Hmm. And and the the zebra soul clearly showed me it had been a zebra like 400 times and it had never been a horse. And all of this horse's behavior was clearly the behavior that a, a wild zebra would exhibit. And within two months, 
I in back in Arizona, I had another horse that people were everybody, all the family members and the friends of this horse. They called the horse horrible names because it had very aberrant behavior out on the trail. It was very reactive. It it was had sort of stalking behavior and it they called it very nasty names. And the horse is showing me I've only ever been a lion. What do they expect? I'm a, I'm a cat in a horse body. And they were like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, we never realized before, but his behavior is very cat-like. So what is happening, I think, for me is that I am here at this time on the planet to be a voice. I have full body chills right now. To be a voice for not only the animals that are incarnate, but the souls, all of our souls, to explain to everyone that we all come from the same place. Mm. Now, I do have certain visions of souls when they come into, if they are meant, for example, to be part of the canine kingdom or the feline kingdom or the equine kingdom. I see the creation of the soul sort of pass through a cloud of programming. And its intention is then to be, you know, a zebra or a water buffalo or a dog. But I also have had clients one in Maryland who had a horse and she went to Ireland. She brought back this $60,000 Irish warm blood, trained it. It got returned three times for aberrant behavior. I talked to the horse. Sure enough, when I look at the horse, it's a little 10 year old girl. The horse is a little 10 year old girl saying, why am I in this body? Mm. You know, a lot of people don't want to have these conversations. A lot of people just want to know heaven is real. Everything is perfect and in perfect order. And everything is meant to be the way it is. They don't want to hear the struggles that souls are experiencing because of their past incarnation patterns coming forward or because of agreements or obligations that they've had with people in past lives and now they're here in this life. And and it's so complicated. We could talk for six or seven hours just on this subject alone. Yes. So you're saying, first of all, that karma has some play in this. Secondly, that there can be mistakes made. And third, that the animal has a clear remembrance of what it was in a past life or in past lives. Uh, sometimes clear remembrance, sometimes not. Sometimes I can help them remember. Uh, for example, I was at a sanctuary in La Vida, Colorado, which is so south central Colorado, um, going toward Wolf Pass, going uh, west toward Pagosa Springs. And um, <clears throat> I didn't know anything about the horse. And the horse came up to me <clears throat> and said his heart hurt. And <clears throat> so I said to the woman, if this horse doesn't release this energy in its heart, it's going to die of congestive heart failure very soon. And she just turned white as a sheet and almost passed out right in front of me. And I I sort of grabbed her by the arm and I said, what is going on? And what can you tell me about this horse? And she said, he's been here 30 days. He's here because his owner is in hospice dying of congestive heart failure right now. Wow. And I said, well, um, let me ask the horse if I have permission to facilitate him letting go of this energy. The horse said, yes, please. So as soon as I put my hands near the heart chakra and started to activate my own heart, which is how I work, Lee. Everything to me is about love and our loving, original, organic, divine spark of God, creator, source, whatever you want to call it. To me, that is the the source of all healing, of all love, the powers of creation. And when I merge mine or shine mine next to an animal, they are able to remember that they have that and they can tap into that again. And as I did that, the horse backed up and backed away from my hands. Mm. And I, um, and now there are some people who will go after the horse. I know what you need. Let me do this to you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to heal you. That's not how I work. I said, why is it you are not wanting to receive this, participate in this healing with me? And he said, because I have an obligation. And he showed me a vision of a past life with this man. And I told the woman, Previously, he was owned by a military man and they died in battle and the horse felt responsible for the death of the human. And he told the 
human in the next life, he would carry his burdens. And the woman said, well, that's fascinating because this man is the sheriff of our county and he has been his horse, um, you know, mounted posse and all of that and, and, and very well known in the county. Um, and it was almost, uh, you know, not exactly the same, of course, because medieval times and all that and, and war and, and all of that is a little bit different than this life, but it was a very similar partnership and a similar, um, purpose in life. Yes. And so what I did was I asked the woman for permission to have a conversation about past life contracts and obligation with the entire herd. And rather than just direct it to the one horse, I felt that we could, you know, really communicate with the entire herd. And I said, you know, guys, my experience is that all of this karma stuff is not absolute. And all of these obligations, most of them are born from a misunderstanding of circumstances and of blaming ourselves for others' choices. For example, the gentleman, the military man, chose to be a military man and chose to die in battle. It was not the horse's fault that he had let his his master down, as was his perception. And I said that these, you know, these obligations, and I have many stories that I could tell you. Uh, one client with a famous dog who had received heroic awards from fire departments and all across the, the U.S., a therapy dog. Um, I don't want to mix the two stories, but just to say that this famous therapy dog, he had 60,000 followers on Facebook. He was known nationally. And I said to the family, this dog will die if he doesn't stop taking on the energy of everyone, you know, that he is um, he is going to help. And they didn't believe me and they didn't allow me to talk to the dog in that way and help the dog remember how just to transmute energy and not take it on. And the dog was dead in 14 months. Wow. But anyway, so I apologize for shifting stories there, and I know we only have two minutes <laughs> left. But um, I know I have one one quick question, which is probably could take you know five shows. But are animals and plants reconciled to the fact that we uh, kill them for our own food? Uh, yes. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, again, there's this certain. Um, genre of animal communicator who do not believe that cows have souls because they are bred for consumption. And that is not my experience. My experience is every has every cow has a soul the same as you or me. Mm. Um, I, I yes, yes and no. Um, I believe that we are getting to a time on the earth where our meat consumption will be very much curtailed, where we will uh, begin to understand that it is not necessary but that if it is done, it is done humanely. They will be raised humanely. We will honor them. We will, um, you know, in the ways of the indigenous people, honor the animal, bless the animal, be gra- grateful for the nourishment that the animal's flesh is bringing to us as we eat. Um, again, that's another very complicated subject. But um, yes and no, uh, and it depends on on the animal. I have to say that a lot of animals I find have taken up a lot of obligation for people um, because they believe that their soul family, their species is on the verge of extinction. And because they are on the verge of extinction, they are now in service uh, in domestication. And it's very sad. I'll have to have you come back again and uh, in sometime in the near future to, uh, to talk some more about that because uh, extinction is, is, just profoundly overwhelming the the earth at this point. Uh, Jenny, how can people get in touch with you? My website is heartofthehorse.us. Heartofthehorse.us. And you welcome people with problems with their animals that can, to uh, for you to solve. Yes, I would say that the bulk of my clients have traumatized animals, rescued animals. Um, I do combine healing and animal communication to try to help in the, in the best way possible. Thank you so much, Jenny, for, for being uh, on and, uh, talking about this. And we will have you back soon. Um, if the folks would like to listen to this show again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org and join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.